morning and happy Sabbath. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, how many of you have no idea who I am? Have never seen me before? Okay, there's quite a few hands. My name is Todd Anderson and I am a uh, missionary pilot down in Guyana, South America, and also a mechanic. Uh, my job is to you fly an airplane out to the remote areas of Guyana and to deliver supplies for our Bible workers and also um, we fly for the government too for their uh, health department to fly bug nets or medications around for them and uh, also to bring people back into town that are sick. Um, but I will say I think my wife, Cassie, who's sitting over here, um, has the tougher job. She stays at home and she takes care of our kids and uh, does homeschool with them, takes care of our household, and she also does the promotions for our project. And uh, after you guys endure me speaking for a little while, she, we have a video that she has made. So um, I'd like to start out with a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for bringing us here together this Sabbath day. I pray that you will be with us this uh, morning and that you will send your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts. Please be with me and help me to present your message in the way that you would have me present it. Um, thank you, Jesus. Amen. It was a typical day in downtown Georgetown. The other pilot, James, and I headed down the narrow side street. I stepped over a man who was still sleeping off his hangover. We round the corner to be forced to walk through a group of sketchy men. They stopped their gambling to st stare at the two completely out of place white men. So I give them each my best missionary smile, non-verbally saying, Hi, I'm a nice guy. Please don't hurt me. We dodge the heavy traffic, jump over the large sewer ditch, and make it safely into the bank. I swipe my debit card, withdraw my $60,000 or 300 US and stealthily slip it into my backpack. I then put my backpack on and go and wait behind James as he makes his much larger withdrawal gas money for the airplane. As I'm standing there waiting, I, I notice that the bank guard is giving me the hairy eyeball indicating that I had better be moving along and not be causing any trouble in his bank. Being the nice, peace-loving, law-abiding guy that I am, I go outside. Now I have a confession to make. I have a weakness. I have a weakness for those secret agent spy movies. You know the kind where the secret agent goes undercover, gets in, does what he needs to do, and gets out undetected and unscathed? Actually, in my Christian walk, I've walked away from such movies, but these exciting stories still linger in my brain. So I slip outside covertly, thinking, okay, I'll seal off the area, securing it for when James comes out with his large stack of bills, when actually I'm looking more like a hunchback turtle with my backpack cinched down a bit too tight. I go, my head cocks to one side and then the other, as I profile the pedestrians looking for the potential attacker. And then I notice... A suspicious bystander leaning up against the bank wall. So I purposefully place myself between him and the bank door. I casually and coolly back up to the bank wall. And bzzz, I jump forward wide-eyed. The other guy stares at me like, what is this crazy white guy doing? And then it dawns on me. I still have my cordless drill in my backpack from working on the airplane. I look over and the other guy is still staring at me. So I casually and coolly say, drill, cordless drill. And the other guy starts busting up laughing at me as I dip my head in shame with a silly grin on my face. The Lord chooses his own agents. And each day, under different circumstances, he gives them a, plan. He gives them a trial in his plan of operation. Christ's Object Lessons, page 330. Unlike my humiliating unveiling as a secret agent, I think the best secret agents are the ones that no one notices. The secret agent must remain secret and undercover. They are the servants that do whatever it takes to obey orders, absolutely trustworthy without fear, never competing for control, and willing to die for their leader. The United States Secret Service's motto is, Justice, duty, courage, honesty, and loyalty. These are the guys commissioned by the United States government to handle some of the most important things like 
protecting the president and the vice president, and also guarding the nation's financial system. I think this gives us a quick picture of what we typically see as secret agents in real life. But my question is, can these ideas translate into agents for Christ? I mean, I think I could speak for a lot of guys here by saying that we have an interest in these secret agent type themes that seems to lie deep inside, almost like maybe God put it there. I mean, every year millions of guys flock to these movies and then they sit there and envision themselves as the secret agent. What guy here hasn't drove from a James Bond movie driving like James Bond? Does God have or want secret agents working for him? Agents that move around unseen, trustworthy, without fear, and willing to die for the leader? I think we all know, friends, that we are living in a battlefield, a great controversy, and there are secret agents working around us all the time that in a battle that we are directly involved in. We read in Daniel chapter 10 where an angel finally reaches Daniel after battling for 21 days with an evil angel just to answer his prayer. And then in Job we see where the devil claims to be the ruler of this world and the human race. And then in the New Testament we see where Jesus steps in. He casts out demons. He rebukes the devil. And he dies on the cross and wins the battle. But friends, the war is not over yet. We still have work to do in each true-hearted endeavor to work out his plan of in each sorry, in each true-hearted endeavor to work out his plan. He chooses his agents not because they are perfect, but because through a connection with him they may gain perfection. Christ's object lessons, page three thirty. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, in the Great Commission, Christ has called us to be his agents. The devil has thrown distractions and decoys at us that have caused us to lose sight of what it really looks like to be agents for Christ. So do we default and mimic what Hollywood has to show us as secret agents? I think my opening story proves not. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 24. I think this will help us with a clear understanding of what Christ's agents look like in the Bible. I'll start with verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to his oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. And then skipping to verse 9. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of the master's camels and departed. Now Abraham is an old man, and he has his son Isaac, who needs a bride, who we know ends up being Rebecca, right? So we have a cast of Abraham, Isaac, Rebecca, and the old servant. The old servant? I grew up hearing this story and never really gave this old servant a second thought. But who actually went out and did the hard work? Yeah, the old servant did. The unnamed, unnoticed, behind the scenes, secret agent. So who really is this story about then? The servant, he cleans, he cleans the foyer and cleans the waxes the cars, or in Abraham's case, he grooms the camels, <laughs> cleans and presses the clothes and so on, all to present the master, not himself, in the best light possible. So yes, the story is written correctly. It is not about the old servant, I bet if we were to ask that old servant, he would say, this is a love story of Isaac and Rebecca. Now, if I were writing the story, <laughs> if I were writing the story, I'd be tempted to say something more like, <laughs> I just went out in the desert, just me, a few men, and some stubborn camels on a death-defying mission, and I wooed a wife for my master's son. No, says the old servant, this is not about me. This is about my master who wants to see his son receive his bride. The old servant forgoes his own identity. In this story, he's only known as the old servant. 
He exhibits pure justice, duty, courage, honesty, and loyalty. A true example of a secret agent. The old servant sets out and walks about 300 miles to Mesopotamia. When he gets there, the old servant prays. Now in verse 14. Let it, let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please, let down your pitcher that I might drink. And she says, Drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And it happened before he had finished speaking that behold Rebecca came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. We have the symbolic correlation a few chapters ago of Abraham and Isaac with God the Father and God the Son when Abraham nearly offered his son as a sacrifice. Now I believe that in this story here, it offers another element in the parallel story. In the book of John, we see where we read where the Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus. The Father sends the Holy Spirit and Jesus reveals the Father. John 15, 26 and 27 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So now the revealing of the secret agent. Who is this old servant? I think that this here suggests that he is representing the Holy Spirit. So let's go back to our story now and see how it all works out in verse 16. The old servant just saw Rebecca coming to the well. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold. She went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her. The old servant, the secret agent, ran to meet her. Not to take a bride for himself. Yes, he sees her as beautiful, but only for his master's son. And in like manner, the Holy Spirit runs to meet us. He sees us as beautiful, but only for his master's son. After praising God for his find, the old servant goes to the young woman's house. He explains what he just experienced about his prayer. And even before he could finish praying, his prayer was answered. And they all agreed that, yes, truly, this does come from the Lord. Rebecca is yours. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as God has made plain. And for a third time, the old servant outwardly praises God for what he is doing. The next morning, the old servant and his men arose, and he said to them, Send me away so that I may go to, away to my master. And then in verse 55, but, the, but her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay with us for a few days, at least ten. After that, then she may go. And he said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said to him, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. There is an Isaac, far off in a foreign land, whom you have never met before, who is calling for his bride. Would you leave it all? Would you leave your homes, your comforts, your families, your jobs to go to him? Maybe I can just stay for a little longer. My family is here and they want me to stay. My family is all I have. Can I really let it all go for this Isaac? Then they called Rebekah and said to her, in verse 58, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. I will go, she said it. She will go and be the bride of Isaac. And when you or I make that same choice to go to our Isaac, the, oh, sorry, when you or I make that same choice to go to our Isaac, the son of God the Father, all of heaven rejoices. So what did the old servant have to offer Rebekah? He had nothing of his own. All he had was what his master had, his son. And what does the Holy Spirit have to offer us? He has nothing, only what his father has, his son. And, and he offers us the most beautiful thing that we could ever need. His son and his sacrifice for us. On the cross. If Christ hadn't died for us, there would be no wooing us. Sure, there would still be heaven and the streets of gold and the holy, glorious presence of God, but it would mean nothing to us because we could not obtain it. 
And we would be lost in our sin for eternity. But we're not. That is the most beautiful thing. We have an Isaac to go to who is inviting us to an exceedingly better life. That is why we have to go. We have to leave our homes, our jobs, our families, our comforts if that is what it takes to go to our Isaac and be his bride. So what do we do as the bride? <laughs> kind of a foreign thought to some of us guys here, huh? But we become the helpmate. We become the servant. We become the partner, the assistant, the servant, the secret agent. We are the bride. I am. You are. The church is the bride. And we have a job to do. We are to join the Holy Spirit to fulfill the crucial element as the body. We are to, like the old servant, leave all we have, including our name, our status, our families. Do whatever it takes and go undercover. Go under the cover of our master's name, letting no one see us. Only the master may be seen. And for his glory, make disciples of all nations. Marissa is an 18-year-old average brown-skinned Amerindian girl. She lives deep in the jungles of Guyana in a village called Karukabaru. Four years ago, her father sent her far off to the region's only government secondary school. But Marissa's father knew that there was some risk involved. Marissa's village, aside from having a fun name, Karukabaru, is home to the region's only Catholic priest. And as you can imagine, having such a prominent Catholic priest in your village means that everyone is Catholic and there is no room for any other denominations. Marissa's father told Marissa that she was to go to the school and not listen to anybody about any other religious teachings. One thing that Marissa and her village did not know is that God was already at work. You may have heard me talk last summer about a village called Paramakatoi and some missionary family called the Gudges. Seeing that some of you haven't uh, seen me before, you probably haven't heard. So here's a quick recap. The Gudge family went through one of our schools in Guyana um, for missionary training called Bethany Medical Missionary College. And then they went out to work in the jungles for God. These people aren't Americans with gracious supporters. These are poor Amerindians who heard the call of their master and set out as agents for him. One day, one day they heard that one of the villages that would not normally allow Seventh-day Adventist missionaries in had a need for a girls and a boys dean in their government secondary school. After much prayer, the Gudges uh, decided to go undercover they applied, were hired, and moved to their new home in Paramakatoi. They began immediately having small Sabbath school groups in their, um, on their small apartment floor, and then word got out. After a short time, they started having too many students coming to their apartment, so they decided to have a voluntary religious worship service early every morning for the students. Marissa, over in Karukabaru, agreed to her father's wishes and set out on the full day's journey to Paramakatoi. Her first morning in the dorm, she woke up to all of her fellow students leaving early in the morning, and she said, where are you guys going? And they said, we are going to the worship service. Not wanting to be left out, she quickly got up and went with them. When she got there, she quickly found out what Mr. and Mrs. Gudge were really all about. In her mind, she scoffed them and she tried to tune them out. But throughout the day, her, their words just kept coming back into her mind. Day after day went on like this. She kept trying to rationalize these new biblical teachings with what she had been taught growing up. But she really liked what they had to say about Jesus. He could be her personal friend and savior. She then started following her friends to the Adventist youth programs. She told herself that she was going for the social aspect and was still a firm believer in her Catholic and animistic ways. Two years later, using funds from a gracious American supporter and bags of cement that James and I flew in on that small mission plane, the Gudges built a brand new small Seventh-day Adventist church in that village. Marissa attended one Sabbath. She silently walked with her friends thinking what would her father think about her going to this non-Catholic church on Saturday. Mr. Gudge gave the message that day and again she thought she would be able to discount and criticize all he had to say. But it wasn't long after that 
that she started having a persistent thought in her head. Why don't you go to the right church? She pushed this thought away many times, but it just kept coming back. Why don't you go to the right church? One afternoon, Marissa finally got out in Bible, thinking that for once and for all, she would prove in her mind that the Catholic and animistic teachings that she grew up with really was the truth. She found the wonderful stories about Jesus, just like the Gudges had taught. He is loving, and he does want a personal relationship with her. And furthermore, she saw how Jesus was asking her to keep all of the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. After many similar studies, her mind was made up. Later that year, there was an Adventist crusade in that small, brand new church in Paramakatoy. Marissa attended, and she pub stood up and publicly declared her love and loyalty to Jesus and was baptized. Four months ago, James and I made a routine flight out to Paramakatoy. We were carrying supplies out for the gudges and, and more building materials so they could finish off the church. And then on our return flight, we had a uh, severely sick elderly lady who needed to see a doctor in Georgetown. While we waited for our patient to arrive, the gudges... We talked with the Gudges and they told us for the first time about Marissa and her friends from Karukabaru. Marissa and her friends are on fire for God. They went back to Karukabaru and boldly told their families about their new relationship with Jesus. Many of the families were instantly angry. They told the girls that their families would no longer support them. If this seven days church is so great, they can support you. They can pay for your schooling and your food. The girls stayed strong. They started, having more, uh, they started having Sabbath school groups for the kids in their village. And they were met with more anger from the villagers. Finally, one of the fathers spoke up to the village council and he said, let's just give these kids a piece of land to have their Sabbath schools on and maybe that will shut them up. <laughs> when James and I heard this story, our jaws dropped. The Holy Spirit has just opened a door into this unwelcoming village and we had better act fast. Two weeks later, responding to a request from these girls, James and I loaded a large rubber bait bin and a suitcase full of pictures, stickers, uh, Bibles, and felts, and other Sabbath school supplies into the plane. And we flew them out to that s small dirt strip in Karukabaru and met Marissa with these tools and our support and encouragement. And I would like to say a personal thank you to each one of you here who has been supporting my family and have we allowed us to support these girls in their uh, endeavor to reach their people. Friends, I can see God working in these young secret agents going into territories that he knows no other missionary agents could go. The village, I, and I would like to invite you today to, to make these girls your constant prayer because still today, even today, the village is still debating over what to do with these Seventh-day Adventist kids of theirs. But friends, it even gets better. This is just one village. There are over 15 more villages surrounding Paramakatoy that are having the same exact, uh, same exact uh, experience with their own kids coming back from school on fire for God, ready to infiltrate their village and lead their people to the master's son. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the master, from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. John 15, 26 and 27. John Wesley said, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. The Father and Son are now standing before us. And they are saying, I want you and you and you to stick your hand under my thigh. And I want you to go and get my people. Go and make disciples throughout the world. And we need to look up and say, I will go. I will go. I will join the old servant, the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And I will go under cover of your name. And I will be absolutely trustworthy, available 24-7, without a single complaint, never competing for control, and willing to die for you. I will be your secret agent. Can we have the video now?
Is this in the way of anybody? Includes uh, getting checked out at each airstrip that I will be flying in and out of. And as the new guy here, it's it's a daunting task. It's there's a lot of things to learn. Just learning the language. I mean, everybody's supposed to be speaking English, but it doesn't always come across as English. The biggest challenge of being a mission pilot is uh, managing time, because. You have so many different things that are constantly pushing. Now, uh, many times you, you have to go out and you have to uh, uh, buy supplies because the projects, uh, they, they have no capability to be able to uh, uh, purchase the supplies. So they're counting on you to be able to uh, get those things. It's also learning where to get supplies. You are the go-to man. You are the in-between man, between the the missionaries, the Bible workers, the teachers who are out in the field to town, to, to civilization. Just all sorts of different things uh, that are required in order for the projects to function. And then uh, you purchase your fuel, uh, you load up the airplane, fuel up the airplane, uh, flight plan, and then once you get airborne, then you have a whole nother set of uh, things that are constantly uh, challenging you. You've got uh, air traffic controllers who are talking to you. You have the uh, projects who are calling you on the HF radio. You have issues like weather. Being out here, you have to make shorter approaches at times. You have to make modified approaches at times. You come in along the rivers and through the trees just to make your airstrip. We just got uh, literally uh, dozens of things all happening all at the same time. And so being able to manage that so that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish, get off the ground in a timely fashion and to be able to get out into the field and get back by sunset, that is probably uh, my biggest challenge. I've been a mechanic, an aircraft mechanic in the States for the past five years. And now coming to Guyana, I'm realizing it's a whole different world down here. It's hard to get things in this country, parts, supplies, even just basic lubricants that we normally would use in the States. We have to make special arrangements just to get them down here for our airplane. We just simply don't have enough people to be able to help us, and so we have to try to uh, accommodate, we have to adjust, we have to flex uh, to be able to get this stuff done. And sometimes, you know, we, we simply don't have the time or the resources to be able to do it all. I think one of the most exciting uh, examples of how God is working here in Guyana uh, has to do with a group that uh, started up in Akurukubaru. It actually started about five years ago when some Bible workers of ours were chosen uh, to be the house mother and house father for hundreds of school kids in Paramakatoi Village. What that means is that they had an opportunity to be able to uh, have worship with these kids every single morning. And that's what they've been doing for years. They've, every single morning, if the kids are interested, they can come to the cafeteria, they can listen uh, to them uh, tell stories about Jesus and to be able to share from uh, the Bible 
and these kids are responding. It's amazing. Some of the stories are just really heartwarming. We were talking to them, finding out what they need uh, next, encouraging them. And they told us that one of their students, or a actually a couple of their students, have taken the, their new knowledge that they had got from these Bible workers of, of Christ and their new love for Him, and they're, they're on fire for Christ, and they went and took that back to their village in Kurukabaru, a village that, that we could normally not just send any missionaries into uh, because of the dynamics going on there. And their, their own children are going back into this village with the Word of God and on fire for Him. One of the fathers finally stepped up into the village and said, let's just give these children a piece of land so that they, they could have their Sabbath schools and maybe that will shut them up. When, when James and I heard that, we were like, whoa, this is the Holy Spirit moving, trying to open a door in this village. What would be the possibility that we could get together some Bible supplies, some Bibles and picture rolls and felts and Bible lessons what about taking them just a whole bunch of supplies? So we had gathered a big uh, Rubbermaid tote and a suitcase full of belts and stickers and, and booklets and Bibles, and, uh, and we flew them out to Karukabaru. And I still remember uh, when we landed, this uh, four-wheeler um, quad came and met us at the airstrip, and there they were. They were a little awkward. They didn't know us very well. But uh, when we gave them the supplies, I could see that they were deeply moved. I could just tell that she was so grateful uh, for, for these, this, not just stuff. It wasn't just stuff to her. It was, it was support. It was encouragement. It was, it was so much more for her. Uh, it's so fun to be able to fly an airplane into these places and to see how God is already at work. God has been working in these locations long before we ever arrived. The airplane is able to support um, our schools. We have a school up in the Upper Mazaruni, uh, Prima Mission Academy, and that school relies heavily upon the airplane. It's, it's like a lifeline. It literally, uh, the supplies, the teachers, the students, they all rely upon uh, the pilot to be able to bring the necessary equipment and supplies and food and, and things uh, to, to make that school operate. But beyond education, the airplane plays other critical roles as well. We get a number of calls to do medevac flights. When somebody gets sick in the interior, it's not just as simple as getting into a car and going to the hospital for treatment. Uh, many places are accessible only by airplane, and so we get calls on a monthly basis to do uh, flights into area where people uh, have malaria, or they have um, you know, a broken bone, or they, they're um, having trouble with childbirth. And so we perform uh, those sort of critical medical-related flights. We, we tried to make a flight into uh, Kopinan. And, and as we were flying in, um, there was rain showers just at the end of the runway. And I came, came flying in to, to land at the airstrip and, and the, the rain was just so hard on the windshield that, and so, so much rain that I couldn't, we couldn't even decipher where the runway was from the edge of the runway, from the, even buildings. It was just a big blur and so we had to just fly through it and do a go around. As soon as I was over the airstrip, it was clear again. So we went around, tried it again, same thing. In a split moment decision, we decided to go to the next airstrip that we were supposed to visit. We fly over the mountains and, and it's just solid dark clouds over there and I couldn't even see where the runway was supposed to be. And I even had the GPS right in front of me showing me it's right there and I couldn't see it. We turned around, came back, tried the coping on airstrip one more time so while in the air we're praying that that god will open up a window up up, up in the clouds um we we turn around and we come back and we pop up over back over the mountain to coping on and we look down and there's sunshine just shining right on the airstrip these bible workers were just so glad to see the airplane coming back 
They thought they thought that we were heading back to town, but they were so glad to see it come back and drop off supplies and just give them hope to continue on for another week until we could come back again. Bible work is the key of why we're here. I, I think the the if I could if I could narrow it down to one aspect of why we do what we do, the one aspect is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. That is the heartbeat of what we are about. And the airplane is just a tool to be able to allow us to do that. But in order to be able to take the gospel into these regions, these distant places, we need people who are willing to go. Ellen White says that it is our privilege to be able to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be part of a team that is preparing for Jesus to come, and not only preparing, but preparing other people, preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. That's why we need more pilots, more airplanes, more people who are willing to come and join our team. So if you would like to come and join our team, my wife and I will be standing in the back. Or if you want to talk to us about anything else, we have uh, prayer cards and uh, this DVD back here. So uh, be sure to pick up a copy if you'd like one. Let's pray. Dear God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are your bride and we have come willingly to your feet. Now we pray that you will send us out with our with the old servant, the Holy Spirit, to go and shake the gates of hell and bring your bride to you. You have put these desires inside of us. Now, please align our desires with yours so that we may be your secret agents and serve you for your glory and honor forever. Amen.